All right, I think we're just about here, and I appreciate all these folks coming here in the cleanup slot. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm Gordon Half. I'm a emerging technology evangelist at Red Hat. And the genesis of this talk is, and I'll, I have some links at the end here, um, is the fact that Red Hat Research is doing some work with a number of universities uh, in this area, most notably Boston University in Boston, uh, around some kind of new techniques that uh, sort of allow the use of data without compromising sort of the privacy of that data. And I'm going to get to that in kind of the back half of this presentation. I'm going to lead off with talking a little bit, kind of taking things up a level and sort of explaining how we got to where we are. The reason, one of the reasons why this is such a hot topic for conversation right now is that zombies eat brains and machine learning eats data. And you know, I will say that this is not exclusively a machine learning problem, but the fact that we really need data to do machine learning, to need a lot of data to use machine learning, has increased the uh, sort of the urgency of these types of problems. Furthermore, their machine learning and things like image recognition can do a lot of pretty cool stuff uh, in the medical area, for example, in terms of recognizing tumors, recognizing glaucoma, and so forth. And there's a lot of hope that we can improve things like medicine by using big data in this manner. The problem is, is that data can be rather private. Health data in particular can be very private. Financial data, a lot of this data we want to, might want to use, and that people in general might be very fine with us using, so long as they're not personally identifiable. Now, this is not in general a new problem, and we have these, uh, this idea of anonymization and pseudonymization, basically the same thing. One sir says you strip off the identifying information, uh, maybe you never collect it in the first place, you know, like an anonymous survey. The other sort of says, well, you have, yes, this, we keep this as an individual record, but we are going to substitute some, some trusted organization is going to substitute a token for, let's say, a person's name. Um, how, you know, so how do you do this? Well, sort of a naive view might be, you know, this isn't really that complicated. You just remove a personal data field, you remove the person's name, uh, you encrypt or transform uh, personal data fields. For example, one thing you might do is if there's a birth date in there, for a medical thing, you might care how old the person is. You probably don't care what exact date they were born on. So instead of you know, uh, 1180, you'll just put 1980. Uh, in the other, the you know, third area, and I'm going to mention the US Census a number of times here, because partly because there is a, a new census happening this year, uh, and they're using some new techniques in it. But you aggregate by a, tr you know, a trusted agency. Your US Census has all the personal data, but you trust them to not use it and not reveal it in a way that people can be identified. Do the traditional techniques actually work? Um, I mean, they do, to a, they do to a degree. I mean, we've been, we've been doing this kind of stuff for a long time, and it mostly works. But, you know, first of all, what's personal data? What do you consider private? Uh, things that, for instance, like salary information that a lot, of, a lot of Americans, for example, consider private information, if they work for a government agency, that might be public. Some countries in Europe, that is public information. Um, who can you really trust? Um, you know, I just said we tend to trust the census with our data. But with all kinds of data breaches and everything else, where it can be hard to figure out who you should trust. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of the real nitty gritty of anonymization here, but just to give an example of a problem, 
a lack of data diversity, a um, thing called k-anonymity failures. What does this mean? Well, let's say I know you are in a particular database, but you know, I don't know anything else. Oh, everybody in that database has a particular disease or a particular class of diseases. Just knowing that you are in that data tells me a great deal about you. And there's actually been a lot of recent research in this area in terms of identifying data, even if it's supposedly anonymized. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is from a deck from the US Census again. One of the things, for example, that you can do is what's called reconstruction. So if we have this table on the right, this is essentially some statistical aggregation of data. And you can basically write a bunch of equations that, that you know, sort of represent this data. And it turns out that you can actually then solve those equations, essentially, and come out with the table on the left. Now, in this case, that data does not have an individual's name, but it does have a fingerprint, essentially, for individuals. And Similar things can happen with, say, you know, browser signatures, for example. You can start to, you have enough of this um, quasi-identifying data, you can start to come up with a fairly unique representation. Now you're saying, we still don't have their name or we don't have their address. True. Which brings us to re-identification. And this is essentially merging anonymized data with other data sets. And guess what? Those other data sets are increasingly common and increasingly easy to combine. And you know, and even if we're not talking private data sets, which you know, a lot of people are, getting, are unhappy these days about the availability of credit databases and that kind of thing for sale, but some, some data is public as a matter of policy. You know, uh, Things like um, real estate transactions in the U.S. or public data, yes, I mean, people can shield them behind trusts and things like that sometimes, but basically that kind of thing is public data as a matter of public record. And a lot of this data that is public as a matter of policy, that may have seemed fine when someone had to go to a dusty county clerk's office and pull something out of a file cabinet. It's a lot easier when someone can just go online. One example here, and I, I couldn't find as good an example of this as I would have liked online, and I was too lazy to, to construct one from synthetic data. But this is essentially someone's, I think, Strava a GPS fitness track uh, where they are, you know, where they're you know, running around or cycling or what, you know, maybe driving here. Now, as I say, this isn't as good an example as I would have liked to have found. We don't know what, who this person is, but I think we can probably start to conclude that maybe they live somewhere around there or at least work somewhere around there. And yeah, that didn't, whoops, that didn't reveal an awful lot in this case, but you know, ima imagine, but, but in my case, for example, I own a house, which is a matter of public record, uh, and I'm sort of in a fairly rural area, and I can guarantee you that if I did this with the GPS in my car, you would know where I lived um, fairly easy. It'd be pretty obvious. And for that matter, and then you know, once you have my name, you can go online and find out a lot more about me. I don't actually go into Red Hat's Westford office very much, but if I did, you would clearly know where I worked as well. And oh, then there you might, you know, not, not, I really don't live a terribly exciting life. But if I did, you could then take that record and go, oh, that's interesting, that spot where he goes all the time. Um, 
this is sort of a, that is sort of an example of kind of the, the broader thing here is uh, often called linkage attacks. And you'll hear again, we have an example of a public record uh, voter registration. Now, depending upon where you live, there may be more or less of that information in the uh, voter registration. I don't, I don't actually think my date of birth is in our local, in my town's voting records, but probably not phone number either. But some of those things are. And again, you know, once you have those, that sort of quasi-identifying information there, um, it basically can link these two records. So if I have this record here that doesn't have a name attached to it, I'm going to have a fairly, start to have a fairly unique fingerprint there that I can then link to this other information. Um, this is actually a really fun example of re-identification. I think it's, it's fun also because it shows just how powerful these techniques can be in ways that are, you wouldn't think, you, you know, how can someone do that? And some of you may remember the Netflix prize a number of years ago, which was essentially, um, they you know, basically gave researchers a bunch of anonymized um, viewing records from Netflix with, rate, with how they had rated movies and that kind of thing. Um, and the goal was to come up with an algorithm that did the best job against a training set of data to, um, to kind of predict what other movies these uh, folks would like. Well, some other researchers said, oh, that's interesting. So they took Netflix data, the anonymized Netflix data, and they also looked at the IMDB movie database. And what they found was that, you know, not with a, anything like 100% accuracy, but they could basically cross match those data. That data oh, oh, this anonymous Netflix movie, you know, um, movie watcher loved movies A, B, and C and hated movies D, E, and F. And oh, Alice on IMDb, hmm. She really liked A, B, and C, and hated D, E, and F, and so forth. And given enough data, you can really start to at least make statistical inferences, if not uh, absolutely certain, pick specific movies. So this kind of brings us to the sort of the researchy part of here. Uh, and these are three areas that, uh, as I say, Red Hat Research, we have some PhD students working in these areas. Uh, I'm going to mostly talk about the first and the third here, but uh, I will mention the second for completeness. So differential privacy is essentially a response to the fact that you know, all this re-identification and everything is sort of eroded the the traditional techniques in this area. I won't say the traditional techniques are completely ad hoc. There is science associated with it. There has been historical research done there. But a lot of it is sort of heuristics and rules of thumb. And basically what we want to do here is to widely share statistics over said data without revealing anything about, in, about the individuals within that data. So, U.S. Census, for example. And this basically, some of the ideas here have been around for a while, uh, but this basically comes out uh, of a two, 2006 work um, with, I forget where her, where her first name is at Harvard, uh, uh, Dr. Dwart, on Epsilon uh, Differential Privacy. And essentially where, what differential privacy is that's different is it's really a formal model. So there's, there's math here. This is not just heuristics uh, as has often been the case in the past. Um, and the idea here is to at least resist these kind of linkage attacks. Think anybody involved in this is very deliberate not to use words like prevent here, and I'll also get to a couple of the limitations of these techniques, but it's certainly something that uh, we're making advances on. 
And the idea here is that you inject random data into a data set in a mathematically rigorous way. So you fuzz up the data, and there, and sort of what that epsilon is, uh, basically trades off privacy and the utility or accuracy of the data. So the, you know, at one extreme, you totally randomize the data and everybody's safe. The data is also completely useless. Uh, and on the other hand, you don't inject any noise at all, and um, you know, and you're you know you're basically not protecting privacy. Um, so the idea, the way this is expressed, is you have this idea of you have a real world co uh, computation, so the actual data set, and then what? And then what if you input it? without the data about one person. So you're taking one person out of there, and you're getting an output. The difference is at most this epsilon. And the idea, so the, and the idea here is if I can't tell whether that one individual is in the data set or not, basically if the noise is such that Someone could be in the data set, someone couldn't be in the data set, and I wouldn't be able to tell the difference from the output. That is essentially what differential privacy is. Um, and as I say, the census is uh, going to be using that this year. Uh, there's been, there's actually been, there's an article in the New York Times, did I include that headline? Yes, I did. Uh, so, so they're going to be including that this year. Um, and the, as I say, a lot, of the, the, a lot of the ideas here have been around for a while. Uh, so going back, going back to like 1930, they sort of said, oh, if we publish statistics about this 10-person town, uh, you know, that's probably not such a good idea. Because even though it's grouped over a number of people, if you have a small enough group, it doesn't do you much good. Um, there is some controversy about this. A uh, number of researchers were complaining that, oh, the census is going to screw us by providing us with less accurate data. Um, the fact is, is that there has been research done and kind of how fuzzing, how much fuzzing of the data you do, and does it really affect things? And the consensus in the research community seems to be not very much. The other problem is figuring out um, what that, you know, have, how much the noise to do have. And as I say, it's a formal process, but one of the problems here is that you use up that epsilon effectively each time you make a query. And particularly with interactive queries, where you can, you know, someone could, in principle, run an unlimited number of queries, well, you can still get around differential privacy that way. Now, what you do is you only release subsets, and once somebody has, you, has made a certain number of queries, they have to switch to a different subset, and you do things like that. Um, so that is kind of dealing with sort of aggregated statistical data. Um, I'm now going to talk briefly for the last part of this presentation about some of the ways that you can essentially, you have a data set and you don't want anybody else to see it. You don't have that trusted third party. Um, one set of techniques is something called homomorphic encryption. The idea here is that, uh, is that you can like ship off a bunch of encrypted data to a cloud provider, and, the, and then operation is actually done on that encrypted data. And then you get the data back, and you can decrypt it. Um, this uses techniques called last-based encryption, dates about 2009. It's very computationally. Um, intensive, and basically it's not very practical at this point. So it's not, today it's not super interesting, although it's, it's an idea. The related area is something called multi-party computation. And the idea here is that is you allow collaborative analysis of siloed data sets without actually trusting a specific third party. So you don't need a US census that you trust in order to do this. And basically, 
conceptually, it's a little bit like some of the, the uh, private uh, distributed ledger slash blockchain mechanisms, and that there is shared uh, is, is that there are shared. Um, in this case, there are shared secrets that you're that you're tr that you're um, sharing among the participants doing the uh, doing the computation. Um, so, some of the considerations in terms of developing here is you know preserving privacy and correctness. What's the th what are the threat models here? Basically, you know, maybe one participant or one third of participants or core participants can be trying to cheat and trying to penetrate the shield. Um, you know, sort of how you know, sort of how much are you worrying about this environment? Are you are, are you just sort of looking for some fairly simple uh, simple guarantees? And that's the sort of thing right now that. There's a lot of the research going on, and um, I will mention uh, that this has been used. Um, this is an example from Boston University. Essentially, a, a number of com the, the city of Boston wanted to look at uh, gender differentials in salary, and basically, a lot of companies uh, said, you know, we'd be willing to share our you know, in principle, we're willing to share our data. In fact, our lawyers do not want us to share that data. Uh, we're happy to participate, but you can't see our data. So that's kind of an impasse. And basically, uh, BU used multi-party uh, computation for that. It, they used a little bit of an atypical setup in that BU still did the actual computation but things were set up in a way with distributed shares that the data analyst couldn't actually see the data. So that's, that's a little bit of a blended mode. In general, there isn't a lot of compute here, but there's a lot of communications overhead, as you can imagine, with, with, the, imagine with these secrets being uh, shared around and moved around and parts of computations being combined together. This is sort of an overview of kind of this space, the way I think of it. Uh, so you have things like uh, I just talked about, like homomorphic encryption, or sort of about dealing with the input privacy. ZK proofs is zero knowledge proofs. Um, Multi-party computation also does some policy enforcement. Arguably, um, trusted execution environments like NARCs are different, but they're solving some of the same problems of not, of not um, trusting the underlying environment. And then differential privacy is really about kind of the output of the data. You trust the data coming in. You, you, know, you trust that the data has been secured through a third party, but then you have to aggregate the data. Um, Ongoing research, um, some of you may have picked up the um, Red Hat Research Quarterly out there earlier, uh, earlier in the, uh, the weekend, but if not, you can, uh, you can subscribe. There is, um, there is an article, and I think it's issue, uh, issue two that goes into some of this stuff. Um, the um, one other thing I'll mention is there is a Python library uh, that works in conjunction with PyTorch uh, that an organization called OpenMind is working on that implements uh, multi-party computation and uh, differential privacy. So if you will pl actually play with some of this stuff, and I think they have some sample data sets and so forth. So with that, thank you all. Um, I have like a minute or two for questions. Yes. Um, great talk, thank you. Uh, I guess first a note on OpenMind. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they also have recently released libraries in JavaScript, Kotlin, and Swift. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I listened to a talk by Andrew Trask just a couple weeks ago, and he, he specifically mentioned the Python, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you see any sort of like ethical concerns there? I mean, now, you know, you're saying that this does provide individual privacy of any of the humans observing the data, but when you're using uh, like machine learning to make decisions on humans, oh, oh. 
Yeah. Well, well yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a whole there, there. Yeah. I mean, there is a whole set of concerns here which I didn't touch here at all. Um, that I think to maybe give an example of something that you're talking about. You know, if you train. Uh, if you train on essentially biased data, you get biased models. So, for example, you know, Amazon trains a hiring uh, algorithm on, oh, here's what our successful employees uh, are like. Oh, we should hire more of them. Oh, you say the gender ratio is really off. Well, I don't, we're just doing what the model said. And, and that is definitely a big, a big problem of, you know, is the input there you have, in addition to holding private, uh, you know, kind of private data, is it, is it appropriate? One more? Anyone? Okay, thank you all. <laughs>